Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is brought to you by the Wedgeside Media Collective store. For the entire month of February, we're offering five dollars off on all of our shirts. So use promo code SHIRT5 at checkout, and you can get five dollars off every shirt. There's no limit. So do it. While you're there, also check out the new Vegan Vespa shirt, which is on pre-order right now. So hurry, get your pre-orders in, and we'll get those made. So head over to WitchSideCollective.org and get yourself some sweet clothing. And remember, shirt five. That's the promo code, shirt five. Yeah. It's like maroon five, but shirt instead. Shirt instead and yeah. no space. Yeah. This is episode 170. Yeah, we talk with anarchist hacker Andrew about hacktivism. Of course, Andrew is a pseudonym. You'll hear the voices modulated. Um, That's how it came across with us. We vetted Andrew the best we possibly could. So sit back and enjoy Andrew. Hey, Jordan, what news and events do you have going on? Well, on February 3rd in France, dozens of chickens were liberated. I love those stories. Yeah. They always give me a smile. Way to go, France. Way to go, France. If you're in Salt Lake City on the day that this releases, Monday the 8th, go to the downtown library and join Anarchist Black Cross in their monthly prisoner letter writing nights. There is no listener shout out this week. If you would like to shout something out, just head over to whichsidepodcast.com, click on the donate tab, and find the shout out section. Besides getting a shout out, you can also get a bandana or a patch from the Witchside Media Collective store. You can record your own shout out or have us record something for you. That's whichsidepodcast.com. Click on the donate tab. Make us be your shill. It gives us thrills. For the slingshot this week, February 10th, 1922, Irish railroad workers seized railroads and were preparing to start running their own trains. Awesome. Fuck yeah. If you like these little tidbits of history, pull them out of the slingshot personal organizer. Go get one. Get your shit organized. It's still not too late. It's February. It's never too late to get organized. You can... Go to your local info shop, or if you don't have an online info shop, either start one or head over to One Like AK Press online. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode. Uh huh. Like that. Like that. That's how you do it. So how's your day going so far? Oh, busy. It's been all right. Tiring. Otherwise good. Getting ready. Just a long, it's a pretty eventful day today. Oh, yeah? Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so you might have heard a uh, of the group called The Return of Kings. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. So they have a protest uh, or they have a meetup organized in Leeds. Uh, in the United Kingdom in Leeds, and uh, I had I infiltrated their meetup because they had changed the location of their uh, of their meet of their meeting uh, from the publicized one to a secret location with a secret code phrase, and I had forged an Amazon receipt book receipt uh, to prove that I was one of them, and then I sent that to them and got access to their secret location and code phrase. In which I published to local Antifa groups. So, so um, that was one of the things that I saw that I was like, "That's the easiest one to do." Like, yep, <laughs> yep. 
I was thinking the same thing. Your your security is only as good as your as your weakest link. Yep. So for for our listeners who who don't know who they are, would you mind explaining who who that group is? So the Return of Kings is a misogynistic uh, and, if you will, pro rape group. Uh, they advocate for the legalization of rape on private property, uh, both of which are complete bullshit. But um, they pretty much think that if a woman uh, gets herself drunk and in a place where she can be coerced by a man, then that's not rape. If the man can coerce the woman onto uh, their their private property, then it's not rape in the first place. Uh, that's just basically it. Uh, they, uh, the owner, or the person who started the whole thing, he goes by the name of Roosh. Uh, he submitted a post a while ago about it, and he... Uh, you know, it, that gained some popularity among the men's rights activist groups, uh, mainly things like uh, this, uh, the Red Pill subreddit on Reddit, um, some other places on some dark corners of the internet. Uh, but pretty much that's, that's what it is, just pro-rape uh, advocacy. I've never understood the men's right like stance to begin with, but going that fucking far just seems... You know, some people just shouldn't exist. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I, com- I completely agree. Uh, they're they're really they're really neo fascists if you if you look into their uh, in their ideology. Um, so again, I take the I take the stance since I am I consider myself part of the anti fascist movement. Um, I take the stance that uh, since you don't support my freedom, I don't support yours. Um, so yeah, they. If they certainly come to question my ability to, my ability and others' abilities to uh, act autonomously, then I can I will do everything in my power to try to stop them. So, labeling yourself anti-fascist, do you would you find yourself uh, being more in the realms of like anarchist thinking? Oh, of course, yeah, of course. I'm a I'm a social anarchist. I don't really know exactly what label to put on myself. Uh, because I kind of like take from all from all things, so I guess that's considered an anarchist without adjectives. But I like to think of myself as a, somewhat of a post leftist, uh, you know, maybe a, tra- a transhumanist, since I deal so much with technology. Uh, definitely anti fascist. Uh, somewhat, I don't. I, I I very heavily dislike capitalism. But I understand free. I understand the need of a, sometimes the need of a market, but not a free market. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Uh, no, I so, totally yeah, that. That does make yeah. sense to me. So yeah. I don't. I don't like currency, but I don't see currency being dissolved anytime soon. If that makes any sense. So I mean, kind of like a currency in the way like uh, Graeber describes it in, in early modern, like in the early times of, of debt. Uh, basically, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, it's just uh, I believe I believe that eventually we'll get to a point where we have developed computers and technology uh, that we can pretty much live off of resources generated by the technology that we build ourselves. So, did your your current um, I guess hacktivism for a better term did that come out of of this political thinking or did this political thinking come first? Um. Well, my my descent into radical leftism. Uh, is interesting. I started. Um, I started. I was interested in hacking well before uh, radical politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was something I've been on a computer since I was six years old. Uh, that's when I started learning how to program and uh, work on you know various bits of code and things. And I first, I first got into uh, computer hacking when I was in elementary school. So I became interested in that and the stories behind it. And so I worked on those and, you know, kind of developed my skills a bit, learning how to program and things. Uh, eventually it switched to a philosophy kind of thing where I started descending into the leftism a bit more when I started realizing kind of the bullshit of the conservatives. Uh, I started reading more Marx and that was really more to the help of music, actually. Bands like Rage Against the Machines some punk bands here and there. Uh, and so I started going becoming an anti-capitalist. It moved me into the communist field which I don't align with at all anymore. And that kind of pushed me. And as I kind of realized, uh, in my opinion, this is, this is just my opinion only, uh, the, just the uh, kind of the audacity that communism has to think that 
if we make a state, then we can dissolve it in the future, uh, as per the Soviet Union and things like that, where I kind of realized, you know, I don't really like it. And I started reading more about Chomsky. And then by the time I was pretty much a freshman in high school, I was a a far-left anarchist. And then that's when I started using hacktivism to further my personal uh, beliefs. So do you think there's a lot of, like, links between um, different hacktivist movements, I guess you could call them, and anarchism? Definitely, uh, because um, there's actually one form of uh, anarchism that is heavily linked with it. Uh, it's called crypto-anarchism. And normally crypto means sort of like, you usually hear the term crypto-fascist, where they're like a hidden fascist, but that's not the point. That's not the case in crypto-anarchism. There actually stands for cryptographic anarchism and the wide use of, of cryptography to bring change to the world. Um, I align myself very much so with that, except uh, some people consider it uh, a far a form of right anarchism, you know, anarcho-capitalism, which isn't anarchism in my opinion. <laughs> but um, they, uh, there's a part of that that believes in the market, so they created Bitcoin and things like that, um, which I think are great tools for now, but they're not going to help us bring about uh, the change that we need in the future um but yeah i align myself with the socialist sect of of crypto anarchism a lot uh groups uh, like anonymous have used decentralized forms of of hierarchy to bring about or the lack of hierarchy to bring about uh, social change in their uh, their political uh, goals there Um, there are various other groups as well that have done it it, a lot of them started out in the 90s uh, called Frack, um, and that's 80s as well. Uh, you have the Cult of the Dead Cow, uh, where they were just people who just wanted to hack into things and have fun, you know. And that kind of and hacking has always been on the, like, on the side of anarchy almost because it's just a, I want to do my own thing. I want to act autonomously because I'm curious sort of thing. So, I mean, a, a lot of the uh, anarchists that we talked to um, come from a very environmental or animal rights standpoint, and they tend to lean heavily towards more primitivism or uh, like deep ecology kind of stuff. Um, it seems like crypto anarchism is like on the complete opposite, you know, spectrum of that. Um, how 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 do you relate towards like those type of anarchists? Um, I don't very I don't favor primitivist anarchism as much as I do other forms of it because I believe. Uh, that technology is such a great tool that we can use um, to further society. I don't really believe in regression at that point. Um, I think everything that we have done to, because I understand the point of primitivist anarchism that we are hurting the environment, that we, that the humans, the humans are kind of, you know, uh, like detriment that we were meant to be in a tribalist and, you know, you know, primitive, yeah, basically primitive. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that uh, humans were meant uh, to be get as far as they can. Um, I believe since we're here, we might as well take advantage of every single tool that we have to our uh, every single tool that we have available to us. And so, um, I kind of feel like that if we use artificial intelligence, that we use computers. We can fix whatever damage we've done eventually. Um, we can change uh, the way we currently work and how, we're, and how we live together. We can replace our, our organs with uh, 3D printed organs or cybernetics where we can uh, start uh, regenerating tissue and things like that. Uh, just recently in the, in the form of uh, veganism, they've recently started researching how to... Uh, generate basically meat uh, without having any animals, without raising animals. So and it tastes the exact same, theoretically. So I, and that's just one uh, version of why transhumanism is fantastic. What about the aspect of technology in of itself? In order to have it, you have to have a certain innate privilege because, you know, especially when you get into like the, the rare earth minerals that need to be produced to, to have the technology and where they're the origins of it and, and how that they're extracted, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, that's something I've long thought about before. 
Um, it's, a, it's a difficult answer because to, with technology does have privilege, have privilege to it. Uh, those who have access to the internet are, can be considered more knowledgeable than those that don't. Uh, we have seen how children in impoverished neighborhoods uh, in Detroit are heavily impacted by not having access to internet at home or computers, and they have to rely on, on shoddy connections in libraries or at school, mm -hmm. and that has deeply hurt their education. Um, I know pe I know people who have volunteered in Africa, and when they went there, they thought before the internet, Africa was a lot of the people were very happy. They thought the United States was just like uh, just you know Libya or or Su Sudan, the Sudan. They thought that it was just kind of the same thing. You know, they they never saw skyscrapers before. And then when the internet actually existed, and then they got to see pictures of New York City. It really damaged their what their opinions of everything was. They they realized, oh, why does God hate us, or you know things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm complete. I'm I completely agree that in, within technology does lie a, a certain privilege, and I think it is our job as a transhumanist and for myself to be able to reach to create technology and create and to innovate so that the technology that we have can be used anywhere in the world. And actually, and I hate name dropping. I don't agree with corporations or anything at all. But just for just you know, as an example for uh, innovation in, in uh, fields, Google is working on making uh, drones that can have wireless that have five G internet beamed uh, just anywhere you need. And so, I mean, imagine a decentralized organization doing that and providing internet to Africa. Or you know some rent remote places on Earth that don't normally have it. That's fantastic, in my opinion. So then, then the question like uh, that always raises to my mind. It it goes back to um, a conversation we were having with Scott Crow, where he was saying the failure of most anarchists is really our failure to create alternative institutions. So how can anarchists create these alternative institutions that are decentralized, kind of like you're talking about with Google? but to give people actual access like how how can we start building those blocks now well i think actually we've already started doing that um i deal heavily in the open source and free software community every software every piece of software that i write i publish under the gpl v3 and that's means completely free it means you can't use it for profit and you have to publish the license and the source code with it so that everybody can see it and access it um We've already seen uh, beautiful projects appear out of the Free Software Foundation. Uh, for example, uh, the GNU uh, slash Linux operating system um, was largely because of the open source movement and the free software movement and the fact that we did not, that the hackers of the time did not want to use, uh, and I use hackers as a general term for people who like to work on code and things, not as the malicious uh, intent kind of thing. It was because people didn't want to use Microsoft's Windows or Apple or whatever they had at the time, and so they built their own operating system, and now it is the most used server-based operating system in the world. In fact, I only use Linux. So I think it's already kind of beginning now where we see um, institutions being created to do it, where we have, uh, they're using open source and free software. Uh, they're publishing how uh you know schematics on how to build your own microchips and 3d printing uh, will be able to let us build our own products and things and they have sites that will allow us to you know uh, publish uh, models of that so we can print them ourselves and i think it's pretty great so i wanted to kind of talk about like well i did want to get into anonymous but i also want to talk about like security culture and also uh, like starter stuff like so do you want to kind of talk about like hacktivism in general and some of the like the tools of the trade and sure. basic uh, like even practices? tools of like uh, uh things like uh you know what kind of computers or whatever Let, let's start with the like, software like just the security aspect of it because um, I know myself and a lot of our listeners are very familiar with like the face-to-face -face security culture, the basic, you know, don't don't talk, keep your mouth shut, don't brag, all that kind of stuff, right? But when it yeah. comes to online security, I think a lot of us 
really are like a deer in the headlights and just don't know what the fuck to do. Okay. So the first, the biggest, biggest um, thing that I can stress to anyone participating in hacktivism and online security culture is one, encrypt everything you can. That's everything. Uh, in fact, for the show, we negotiated to uh, to use a uh, an encrypted chat client to chat. So we're using that. It's an open source uh, or, or free project, I can't remember which, called talks.chat. If you haven't used it, check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, but we're actually, we're talking right now, and we exchanged public keys to talk. And so everything we say is encrypted going from one computer to, you, to from my computer to your computer. And so nobody in the middle can intercept it and decrypt it. That's impossible. Um, so encryption is the absolute key to security now. 100%, you have to encrypt everything. The cool thing with it is that if you use Linux, you can use, you can do full disk encryption. And this is, this is where it gets technical. I'm not going to dive really far into it, but basically imagine you have your flash drive and your hard drive. What you do is you encrypt your hard drive completely, and then you put it uh, the, the part that boots your computer on the flash drive, and then you can use that. So if anybody, for example, when you cross the borders, they might ask you to turn on your computer or to look at it or to unlock your phone. If you encrypt your laptop, for example, and it's you use full disk encryption and you don't have the bootloader, which is your flash drive, on the, on you and near the computer when they ask you to turn on it'll act like it'll pretty much just look like there's nothing on the hard drive and you can tell the border patrol person uh i don't have anything on this hard drive and they can't prove otherwise because it looks all random data. it looks like it's all random data on there um encryption is pretty much the forefront of privacy in any anti-police state uh, adventure uh, if we don't have encryption, it's it's akin to not locking your doors. So there's been a far right movement to to get rid of encryption, and I have been heavily fighting that by writing cryptographic software and learning everything I can about it. Uh, so I urge anybody who's interested in hacktivism to literally dive as much as you can into cryptography and educate yourselves. Um, um, for users who don't use use Linux, maybe they use Apple or they're forced to use Windows. Um, I use BitLocker. I don't know how good that is um, for my laptop, but but what are other ways that people can encrypt their their actual uh, computers or laptops? So my experience doesn't go that far into Apple or Windows, but I can tell you this: the one thing you want to know about encryption software and cryptographic software is if it's not free or open source, it's basically useless because nobody can tell if it has a backdoor or a weakness in it, or if it, or even if it's implemented correctly. Who knows if the government can access it when asked. So, for example, in your case, BitLocker, I'm going to tell you it's not secure at all. Um, it's 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 closed source. Apple or Microsoft can say it's it's secure all they want, but they have no way to prove it unless they reveal the source code, which they refuse to do. So, uh, in my opinion, there there was a project called TrueCrypt, and that that is open source, and that one is good. That one is fantastic for Windows, and I think that works on Apple as well. Um, but so that the development ceased on that. And so I think it was forked into another project called VeraCrypt. Um, I can't remember exactly, but if you look up TrueCrypt and then TrueCrypt alternatives, you'll find the one I'm talking about. Just make sure that what you use is absolutely 100% free or open source. I, kn I know that PGP had a full disk encryption at one point, but I think they got bought out by somebody as well. It used so to PGP... PGP is the commercial version of mm -hmm. PGP itself, the pretty good privacy, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, the free software project, uh, GNU, uh, uh, you know, Freedom, the Freedom so Free Software Foundation, they created a replacement for it called GNU PG. So that's G N U P G. Mm -hmm. um, they did that, and it's pretty much a, PG, a free software PGP replacement, and that's what I use, and that's what everybody I know uses. So if you're looking for a PGP, a PGP replacement, use GNU PG. Sorry, I'm writing is, this down, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the difference is practically banal between them. Um, I definitely recommend to use GNU PG. Uh, we use it. 
I use it everywhere. Uh, whenever somebody emails me, it's encrypted. And then I just decrypt it, then shred it. And that's that's the GPG, right? Yeah, that's called GPG. Yeah. Okay. So so when you, you say shred it, I mean, you're not actually printing it out and then shredding it. You're... <laughs> No, 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 no. Shred by shred. I mean, that's. I mean, that's like a. We always we have a joke when the. Uh, I can't remember who who asked it, but somebody asked Hillary Clinton if she wiped her hard drives, and she said, "Do you mean with a cloth?" <laughs> and so it's, it's like it completely went over her head. She had no idea. But uh, so no, by shred, I mean it's actually a command on Linux where you can shred. Uh, you know, file that just and it basically fills it up with with uh, random data and zeros or whatever you choose it to be, and so that can't so that it can't be recovered. So another thing too is if you feel that you have been compromised, then you have to get rid of all the data securely. So that's not just a quick format. That's not just to delete it on your on your computer, like move into the recycling bin and delete it. This is you have to either take your hard drive and, and physically destroy it by drilling holes through it. By melting it, or if you if you don't want to do that and you want to keep the hard drive, then you can use software to do it. So usually, if you're on Linux, you can DD the drive, and I'm not going to delve into specifics, but uh, but you can also use something called DBAN, where you just boot into it and then just delete the drive using something like a DoD standard for uh, top top secret file erasing or something. They have different options on there. It's called Derek's Boot Nuke. Uh, but just call, just look up DBAN. Um, just install it on a flash drive, boot up into it, and then delete it. And that way, so if, say the FBI were to come and take your computers, uh, then they, if they pull off the hard drive, they just see it's been deleted. Um, and if they have, like, you have to be careful, though. Um, if you're under investigation and they tell you not to do anything, then that can be considered, a, uh, you know, getting rid of evidence. So if you think you've been compromised, it's better to just get rid of everything and start new. What What about phones? Um, you know, how many with how many people use their phones nowadays? Um, what's the best way to keep your phone secure? Phones are tricky, uh, mainly because they're all typically proprietary hardware. Um, proprietary means that uh, we don't have schematics for it. We don't know how they're built. Um, all I can say is, if it's on your phone, uh, just expect, just don't expect privacy. Uh, usually negotiate with other people, have different ways of communicating how they're going to uh, actually, you know, uh, communicate with each other, have different ways to figure these things out. Use encrypted apps. So there's certain phone apps for text messaging called Text Secure. Another one, so one's called Signal, where you can use encrypted phone calls, I think or a red phone, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but if you use those, you can somewhat, you know, protect yourself. But otherwise, I really don't consider phones secure at all because they have G they're basically just, like imagine, it's like pretty much the CIA and NSA's FBI's wet dream because you have a GPS and a microphone and a camera all in one and you carry it with you everywhere. So if you're going anywhere, so, I mean, don't really talk about these things in in that are not on your computer. That's just how that's just how I've always worked. Yeah, we know of some um, ALF activists that were convicted by their GPS location and text messages um, yep. being sent. Yep. Yeah, that happens. That happens all too often. Oh, and um, before I forget, going back to encryption, be sure you use a good password. Um, so there's a like I need to explain secure password security. I think. Uh, to those people that don't know, they think a longer password is more secure. That's not always the case. Um, you, what you want to look for is something called Shannon Entropy. Just Google it. There's calculators available online. You want something that's at least 70 bits of entropy, and then it basically takes centuries to crack it. Uh, so at least 70 bits of entropy, and you're good to go. Um, you want to use typically you know, a phrase, something, something that means something to you. Uh, that nobody remembers. Don't write it down. Don't do anything like that. Uh, but good secure password is all you can use. My my friend Jeremy Hammond, shout out to him. He's in prison right now uh, because his password was something like the name of his cat one two three, and the FBI was able to crack that. 
had he had a more secure password, he might have not had that such heavy evidence against him. Well, that actually brings up something I wanted to talk about as well. Um, prisoners, prisoner support, and maybe briefly talking about like incarcerated folks like Jeremy Hammond, Barrett Brown, um, maybe some other people that were also associated with hacktivists in, in some way or another. And I also want to talk about uh, like people like uh, Sabu or Hector, whatever yeah, his name is. Those assholes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So um, do you want to kind of give people like a brief uh, rundown about who Jeremy Hammond is and who Barrett so, Brown is? Yeah, so Jeremy, Ham- Jeremy Hammond was a uh, hacker um, pretty much in Wolf's second anonymous, if I remember correctly. Uh, he uh, basically did, he was, he's also a fellow anarchist, he, Antifa and everything. He uh, leaked, he, he did something, I think, with the credit card dump, if I remember correctly. I'm not up to speed on, on Molsec, that was a long, that was a long time ago, actually, relatively. Uh, but he did uh, some, I think he might have hacked emails or something from a company called Stratfor and leaked them. Um, so what happened was he, uh, uh, that happened, Sabu, pretty much, Hector Monsiger, uh, he's now just some asshole on Twitter. Uh, he basically was an informant for the FBI. Uh, the FBI came by, uh, and forced him to, uh, you know, well, they didn't force him, they asked him and he agreed. Uh, they still coerced him to do it, so... He's still an asshole, but whatever. He uh, basically gave up all his friends, uh, his comrades, so to speak. So that happened, and it got Jeremy in uh, prison. Um, Barrett Brown was an anonymous activist. Uh, he was a reporter slash journalist. Uh, all he did was really link to. Um, I think this. I think all he did was link to the Strat Four uh, leaks. And the FBI pretty much arrested him for it. And that was a real bullshit, really bullshit trial. If anybody should be free, it's Barrett Brown right now. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, pretty much. What's the best way we can support people in in prison um, like these two? Um, So each person has their own unique needs. Uh, They usually publish them through their support groups. Uh, they asked them specifically. I, Jeremy Hammond actually proud to say that his, he had an Amazon wish list, and that is no longer anymore. Everything got filled out. Everything got sent to him. But he asked for it, so that's fantastic. But the best way to support them is just, you know, write them letters. Don't put anything usually political in it. Uh, nothing that you wouldn't tell a cop. Uh, send them letters. You know, send, donate money if you, have, if you have the chance. You know, give them something off their wish list if they have it. Uh, usually their support groups will typically have things that you need to, uh, things that they need that you can do for them. And they'll offer ways to do it. So that's the best way is just to look at the support group. I think like um, bringing up like Hector is a, is a good good reminder that the majority of arrests happen because people talk. And uh, yep. he, that's, it's something that, per, that permeates uh, anonymous. I personally don't align with anonymous uh, simply because uh, there's just there's too much danger involved in it. Uh, if you've ever hung out with the people there, they pretty much come off as kids almost. And I'm not saying that to generalize or offend anybody. Uh, if you go hang out on IRC channels, the main channels are like filled with arguing and bickering and just people who don't know much about it and they don't shut up. To, you know, to say the least, they don't they don't stop talking about stupid things that they should talk about. Um, there, it's called operational security or opsec. You want to keep it tight. You don't want to talk about anything that you don't want to get leaked. Uh, disinformation, things like that. These people don't practice all, any of that practically. Um, so I really distanced myself when I started feeling that. When I started feeling the heat from that, um, they. Uh, the issue with that is that these people, they will talk openly about it and they tweet about it. And I mean, it's like you're using Twitter. I get it that you want to use Twitter as a way to do it, but also, you know, you know, you got to keep the connection secure. You have to make sure everything is locked tight. Like I said before, your security is only as good as your weakest link. 
Uh, and if you have a weak link, you will exploit, they will exploit the hell out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so these people, they, you know, they, they flaunt their hacks, they, they flaunt uh, everything they do. When in reality, what they just need to do is just get it, do it, and shut up, and then just wait for whatever happens, happens, and then make a statement, you know, uh, and, and like an anonymous statement, not like, you know, like, oh, look what I did, look what, what's going on. Collaborate with people you trust, you really, really trust. Um, don't ever join any servers that aren't your own, you know, stuff like that. And that's what happened in LulzSec, too. They joined Sabu's personal server, which mm. was obviously accessible by the FBI. And that's another issue. So there's just a whole operational security standpoint. Just use common sense. And these, a lot of these people just don't really have it. And that's an issue with these big decentralized groups is that they don't they don't teach that from the beginning. And I guess remaining anonymous kind of um, online seems to draw some comparisons to like people in the underground um, scene, like the ALF, ELF, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, yeah. The, the interesting thing about that is, I mean, I could just go to, to a, a local town and start going, hey, do you know where, they, where I can talk to people in the ALF? It know, happens. Like, actually be... <laughs> it, yeah, it happens. You know, it's, it's the, you know, it shouldn't happen. Um, but, you know, inevitably there, inevitably, inevitably there is, that will, you know, occur at some point. But you have to be prepared to handle it. These are, that's what the idea of InfoSec is. You have to handle these leaks. You got to handle these issues quickly and get them fit, fixed, done, you know, when it, when it happens. Um, sadly, this just doesn't happen much in the anonymous culture. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll find people just publishing, Hey, come talk to us in our, in our, in our channels. I remember, I remember somebody was pissed off about me because I did something to one of them. Uh, cause they, he was a, like basically a, a crypto fascist. So I, you know, I did some, not some nice things to him. And before you know, a bunch of his supporters started, started op docs me, except it was my name. And so. I remember I just joined their their IRC channel where it, where it was and just convinced them that I wasn't me. And then I just sat there and as they collected all the wrong docs about me, I just watched their laughing my ass off providing disinformation the entire time. And, th and they totally <laughs> thought I was some random guy in Nebraska or something like that. And I wasn't anywhere near that part of the world. And it was just the funniest thing in the world to me. I was like, wow, I literally just invaded this movement and disinf just disinfoed it for hours until they just succumbed to it. That's actually so, some. That is something else that um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, just the ethics of like doxing. I know that that's really common within like Anonymous. Um, yeah. yeah. So doxing is interesting. Um. And also, can you explain what that is to people who might not yeah, know? Yeah, so doxing is just basically the publishing of uh, publishing of personally identifiable information. So, uh, not just identifiable information, but just really just personal information. So things like your address, your full name, your date of birth, your social security number, uh, phone number, if I didn't say that already, um, things like uh, credit score, uh, stuff like that. <laughs> So widely these would get published and anonymous. They used to use something called the docs bin before that got shut down. Um, but yeah, I used to go, used to be able to go on there and look at all these docs from some asshole, some who got docs pretty much. And sometimes they're, most of the time they're not, they're not correct. A lot of the, sometimes they are. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, the ethics of docking, doxing are interesting just because um, you know you're it, it can result to a lot of damage personal damage to that person um usually it can be used like if, and if especially the issue with it is that sometimes like i said most of the times they are wrong and if that happens then you just really just like kick some random per innocent person's ass you know, mm -hmm. uh, and that's not really a good thing. So a lot of the times is, like I said before, the issue with an anonymous too, especially it was really, it's largely irresponsible because they do it on mass scales. Like for example, I think I read where they published 
like the docks of a bunch of police officers. You know, anarchists, I don't really give a shit, fuck them, kind of mm-hmm. thing. But they, uh, like, when you think of mass docks, and I know how, because I do doxing on a, on a really high level a lot of times. I did it this morning, I finished it, got it published uh, secretly to people. So that, that docs isn't public quite yet. Um, but uh, basically, I did a lot of work and verified the information 100%, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but these people, when they do it on, on such a mass scale, they don't try to verify any of it. It's just like a really reckless behavior with just throwing it out there. And so then they think they're doing a good thing. To everybody else in this mob mentality, they, they get told, oh, you're, you're doing such a great job, you know. But in reality, you might have actually just hurt an innocent person. And that's not okay. So you want to verify everything, and you got to just be careful. That's all it is. Common and, sense, like I said. And that's like a, another thing. It's Sometimes I see um, anonymous doxing other people that are, identify as anonymous because they don't happen to agree with the operation or action that they did. And so yep. I, I kind of wanted to talk about like that that seems super scary if like you're a part of like the same movement and you're you know doxing each other and also um like maybe the the structure are um of anonymous and the belief system because it seems like some people might not necessarily um they perform actions that aren't morally just to say another group of people from the same movement yeah uh, so that's another issue why I separated from anonymous, anonymous pretty much, uh, just because the just there's a whole you know the moral aspect behind it. You don't know who you're collaborating with, uh, not on one personal level, but just you know theoretically, it could be a CIA, FBI, NSA, whoever, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they they would publish docs on just you know different operations on just people in different operations and. Uh, You know, I mean, you get the whole, it's pretty much just like inter, uh, what's the word, inter-movement politics, pretty much, uh, where somebody may not agree with the spokesperson of whatever movement, and so they, you know, it just fires up, except it's really more harmful because they're, again, they're docs. Like, when you think about it, you're, you're an anarchist, you should be, you know, you're not really supporting prison. You don't really, I, I don't support prison, I don't want anybody to go to prison. I don't really call the cops at all, you know, but when you do publish docs, you have to remember that the police use that information. So if you do publish docs on, on your fellow movement member, you could end up putting them in jail. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you got to be careful with a lot of this stuff. And isn't vanning something as well? It's where you call the police on somebody and... Or something like that. What is that? Is just a, vanning is just a term, just like you know, I say so and so got banned, or you know, they they got picked up by the FBI, or you know, something like that. Are you thinking it's, of swatting? Where they? It's, swat- not, it's not like a, it's not like a process like sw- like swatting, for example, is you can swat somebody, but you yourself cannot ban someone because that's an FBI thing. Okay, so the FBI can ban you, but you can't ban anybody. Else. So maybe I'm thinking of swatting. That's where no, swatting is probably what you're thinking of. Okay, so what is that exactly? So basically, you uh, pretty much use uh, like a payphone or whatever uh, to call the SWAT. It's pretty much you get a SWAT team to go to somebody's house and they raid their house. Uh, it's, it's pretty fucked up sometimes because it can actually lead to you know murder because we've seen how easy cops are mm-hmm. to kill people, and especially if you're an animal rights activist, they will kill your they will kill your pet with no problem. In, with just impunity, it's really messed up. But um, you know, it, like the, I'm, I'm all for it. Like for example, if a bunch of fascists are meeting up, swat them. I don't give a shit. It's not my problem, you know. But you, again, you have to be careful with who you're swatting in the first place. I don't, you know. It's it, like I said. It's just I'll just be careful. Basically, you you call them up and you're like, hey, this person has my has a. I have a wife and child. I have a wife and my wife and my child here at gunpoint, I'm going to kill them, blah, 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 I have bombs, blah, blah, blah. And eventually somebody's going to show up with a bunch of assault rifles. So that's just what swatting is. I mean, get, speaking from as somebody who has woken up with the FBI with a P90 in my face, it's the most fucked up thing you can do to somebody. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it, de- it definitely is. I, I would not want to want to wake up to that. Um, it, like back in now, it's especially for hackers too. Like mean, back in the nineties or something, and they used to do SWAT teams because they, you know, they thought you could like. I don't know, they thought you were, like, super-powered man who could, like, turn off guns for whatever reason. Like, they thought one hacker could whistle into a phone and launch a nuclear bomb, which, not true at all. Uh, so they would use SWAT teams and raid people's homes with it. Now it's just the FBI that shows up, knocks on your door, and then arrests you. So they kind of calm down a bit with it. But, yeah, SWATing is definitely a really dangerous aspect of everything like that. I- I'm still a little taken aback about using the state repression against those that we disagree with. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a certain interesting aspect to, to that. Um, I, I don't really, it's just, it's a weird phenomenon that has really only popped up recently due to like, uh, you know, uh, like for example, I think it was Lizard Squad or something that did something like, like that. Uh, they did it, but a lot of it they did it to, you know, to oppress feminism in video games. And I'm, and Neil, I'm just, I'm sitting back like, holy shit, you want to kill, like, if you swat somebody, you're pretty much telling them, you know, I don't really give a shit if you're dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pretty horrible. Yeah. wonder if he could swat the state. <laughs> <laughs> He's the... like calling a swat team into like a... Uh... Into like the capital or something. Like, I have a bomb. I'm, 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 I'm gonna. I have a hostage. I have, I have everybody here. They're all gonna die. And the SWAT team just shows up. Yeah, I, I get to a point when they when they're when they're pulling in legislation, like a legislation day, like the first day of legislation in a capital, and you just call the SWAT team there. Oh man. <laughs> I mean, I, Why I guess, are people doing that? Why are people doing that? That's a, that's a good idea. I mean, they do get bomb threats. I guess that's close, yeah. right? Yeah, pretty much. But I mean, <laughs> it's not like a SWAT team goes in there and puts a gun to, the, to somebody's head and's like, "Get down!" And there's somebody with a bomb here. I can I, I picture the poster in my head right now. You have like a Capitol building with a fly swatter over the top of it. Yep, SWAT. Yeah. <laughs> SWAT your fence. SWAT your Capitol. Yeah. <laughs> This is Judge oh, Joe man. Smith. I have a gun, and I'm going to kill everyone in my courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm pretty sure there was a situation like that. I don't remember. It was like in the 80s or something. Or maybe it was in Canada. I don't know. Some guy put a gun in a courtroom and held a bunch of people hostage, and then they showed up. You, could, you know, you totally could, though, do that. I'm in a courtroom. Like, you're, like for example, they're having a grand jury that you don't specifically agree with. All of you them? just call up the SWAT team and just be like, hey... I'm going to kill everybody in the courtroom, and then the SWAT team just shows up and ends the grand jury. There we go. Your friend just got saved. I don't know if they could go in because it's a secret meeting. Yeah. The SWAT team? Oh, they'll, they'll go in. I mean, <laughs> they don't respect my rights. And they're I'm breaking the damn law. Sure they don't respect the, the court's rights. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see that happen. It'd be kind of funny. Well, if it does happen, you heard it here first. Oh, okay. I shouldn't say that. Never mind. No, you did not. No, you did no, not no, hear did that not. here. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> you heard it from some bum fuck. What is it? What's that? What's that organization called that published that? You read it. You read it in in the Coming Insurrections Volume Four. <laughs> so, whatever the, the the Black Hand or whatever French organization that was that published that book. You heard it from them. I'm not even familiar with that. Oh, really? Yeah. It's like a post-leftist text that were basically the, uh, like an organization called the Black Hand in France um, wrote a book about the coming insurrection and what an anarchist needs to prepare for insurrection against the state. It's Glenn Beck had it on his show, and it's one of the funnier <laughs> segments of the show that I've heard where he goes calls it the most evil book he's ever read, which is really funny because I think he secretly liked it because he liked how much it was against the government. But <laughs> It can't um, be the most evil book because he's read the Book of Mormon. Exactly. <laughs> true, true enough. Yeah, he, uh, it's funny. It's just, it, it made all these rounds everywhere. It became like a bestseller in like the New York Times or something. And it was just a, it was a pretty good book. It, Check it out. It's free online. The PDF is free. Just go look it up. 
I'm I don't know how I missed that one. Hmm. It's pretty good, I have to say. It's it's it, pretty, it calls out the leftist movement as a whole, saying you're not doing enough. Uh, pretty, you need to ins- you need to support insurrection, and it pretty much tells you how. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So so speaking of, of like texts like that, is there any like like modern anarchist texts that really go into the crypto anarchy or any even like the you know, classic anarchist literature that you really draw inspiration from? So the not really because it's such a new thing. Um, I really enjoyed the closest one I can come to is probably one of our more modern uh, anarchist philosophers is Noam Chomsky. Uh, just because he talks about just you know some oppression like. Uh, you know, what we can do against the state, how it should be done, what anarchism is. Uh, it pretty much provides such a, such a basic underlying uh, fundamental structure of anarchism that, you know, it provides anybody with the basics to continue on to what crypto anarchism is. And crypto anarchism is simply anarchism plus technology. So you can pretty much say, I'm learning how to make cryptographic software. So I'm going to make cryptographic software in my free time and publish it online. And you're a crypto anarchist because you're doing the world a favor through it. So, like when when I think of hacktivism, the only like the first thing that comes to my head is uh, denial of service attacks. And yep. to me, denial of service attacks just seem like the classic like sit-ins in front of businesses, right? Where it's more they for are. show, but doesn't really get huge results. Definitely. Um... I don't really like denial of service attacks for a form of hacktivism. I think it's a great tool to get your beliefs out there. If you take, like, for example, take down the sites of PayPal, that's fucking awesome. You did a good job. You know, that's a pretty hard thing to do. You did a pretty good job with that. Um, but, you know, otherwise, I just don't think it's that useful because nobody really cares. And, and, they're, and if they have good system administrators, they can stop it in the first place. Yeah. So... It's not really that useful, in my opinion. Uh, if you're going to do something like that, if you want to do hacktivism, I think it's better just, you know, social engineer your way in, you know, get inside the organization, completely fuck them over, uh, you know, from inside out. Like, what happened with Sony was, oh, was amazing. Where uh, I, I, apparently North Korea did it. I have friends who, who did the investigation, and they told me that North Korea was in, actually the evidence led to them doing it so i'm like holy shit well i didn't believe it at first but okay good good job wow i don't support totalitarianism at all but congrats you fucked over a horrible corporation (laughs) (laughs) good job yeah so i think things like that are are more effective as we saw you know it was pretty awesome Mm -hmm. so Besides denial of surface attacks, what really is is hacktivism? Like you say, going in and getting through security, but what what does that really like mean as far as um, like operationally speaking? Like what what does like what results can you really get out of that? Um, you mean by just breaking into an organization or something? Y- yeah, like 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 yeah, yeah, basically. Okay, so if you get into into an organization, you can. You know, there's there's two things you can do. You can do both of them if you want, but there's probably more than that that you can do than just two things. But one is publish information. So information should be free. You know, if it's horrible, bad information about some corporation or whatever, leak the information, leak their emails, do whatever. Two um, is, you know, fuck them over. That's always a fun one, too. So... You can just completely fuck them over and then make sure it's really hard for them to function again, especially if you don't agree with it. So, for example, imagine PayPal and you fucked over their servers. They couldn't function for maybe a few days and they lose tons of money. That's pretty awesome. Um, Say you find some horrible things PayPal's doing and you leak the emails. That's pretty awesome, too. If you do both of those things, you're pretty fucking awesome. I mean, you can't go wrong in, in anything you do. In that. It's pretty great. So do you think that data leaks are more effective than, like, SQL injections? You said DDoS, definitely not. But things well, that... SQL injections are just a means, are just an attack. Mm-hmm. Um, SQL injections are a way to gain access to it, and then you can leak, leak it. So, for example, 
and the example of like actually medicine, they, they leaked a bunch of people. We found out a bunch of government accounts were in that. So I had friends that wrote software and leaked all the names of the government officials that used it, you know, whether they use it or not. But, you know, uh, they had like I, data leaks are great. Uh, if you're leaking data, I always, I, I'm for a favor of just doing both if you can. Um, but those, those personally are just my favorite things, especially when you get something interesting out there and you give it to reporters, reporters report on it, and it goes from that. Like, for example, a denial of service attack might get a day, a, two, a day or two in, in the media. If you do what, what happened to Sony, they got months. Mm-hmm. They got like a month of airtime on, on the news. That's amazing. You know, imagine if an anarchist organization took credit for what Sony did. That would be that would put hacktivism and anarchism at the forefront of the news at six PM every fucking night. And that's what I that's what you need to see. Yeah. I think you're right. I think that data leaks definitely draw more news. Like you hear about websites getting defaced and stuff like that, and you might hear about it for a day or so, but then it just fades away. Because it gets fixed, but yeah, definitely. leaks reveal things that weren't supposed to be revealed. So leaks stay there forever. Once it's on the internet, it's there forever. So that's what people need to remember: is that denial of service attacks are fixed, servers are fixed, but data leaks are there forever. Um, wasn't there the one of the founders of Reddit who um, I think he he passed away. Um, Aaron Swartz. Yes. Mm-hmm. It wasn't he something involved with releasing free library books or accessing freely? Yes. So that is the MIT library. Let me Google that real quick. I think it's called J Stars. No, that's that's a whole different thing that the US government disregarded that. MIT some MIT It was like library. research papers. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. Uh, it was the MIT Open Library or something? I can't remember. Yeah. I, mean, I don't remember the name of it, but basically it was, uh, he went into a closet, got a hard drive and started copying, or I'm not even sure if he went into a closet, he might have just sat, sat down somewhere and started copying all this information. He started copying this entire library, which you normally had to pay to access. This mm-hmm. is one of the most like intellectual crimes, if you have one. And like, it's the best example of how the government is oppressing hackers and hacktivists. And free, you know, inf- freedom of information people. They, he took an entire library from MIT and tried to and tried to make it free, but instead the FBI arrested him, arrested him, uh, arrested him, and then they uh, basically, you know, slapped slapped him with said saying I think it was like you could have fifty years in prison, and he pretty much killed himself because of the fear of that. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's a horrible thing that happened. And it's, when you think about the crime, it's really ill-proportionate to what happened. You, you, do you deserve 50 years for stealing a library? For example, if you downloaded an entire Barnes & Noble inventory and leaked it online, do you deserve 50 years? No, of course not. If I recall correctly, MIT didn't want the charges that they were brought against him. Exactly. That's another thing, too, is MIT didn't want that. MIT is very... The origin of the term hacker started at MIT. It was people who do creative things. MIT is such an open culture about these things. They don't really care. The issue was that MIT said... we. They said it's irrelevant, stopped, you know. But the FBI said, no, fuck the hacker. We're going to take him out. And they tried to make him like a poster child for any future hacktivists. Um, I know that there's been a, a lot of, of hacktivism around uh, animal rights issues. Do you know Do you know much about those individual uh, campaigns? Um, not really. Mine deals, I deal more in the sides of anti-fascism. Um, but I have kept up with some of it. I remember recently, I think somebody did a denial of, anonymous did a denial of service attack on Nissan. Uh, uh but I remember that one was curious because I think I think I read that Nissan shut down their servers because they were getting a denial of service attack. So rather than let the hackers win, they just shut down their, their servers themselves, which I thought was really curious instead of trying to mitigate it. Uh, that was really weird uh, from a security standpoint. But I, 
I don't really keep up much with it, but I, I applaud them. I'm also, I support the ALF. I think it's great what they're doing. Um, but my interests lie a little elsewhere for the time being. Do so you, for people that want, are... you want to, if you want to discuss them, I'm completely willing to talk about it. If you want oh, to for me. I, I honestly don't know too much about them. Um, I know that okay. um, they, they hacked like a hundred plus sites in protest of um, cetacean slaughtering um, wow. that was going on in Japan and Iceland. And they called Did it they like them or something like that. That's probably my guess is they, and what is that usually? Is that just, uh, oh, because I noticed so... that a lot of times like the, it's just like the a front cover, but the the site's actually functioning if you access it elsewhere. Yeah, so pretty much uh, defacement is like is like a version of graffiti. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you hack the server, you put your defacement page on there, maybe move the root directory for where the website is actually stored somewhere else. Uh, but if you're like me, you just delete it and say fuck them anyway, <laughs> and uh, you know just let them deal with their bullshit. I hope you backed up, <laughs> uh, or hope yeah, you didn't. They, yeah, exactly. Yeah, hope you didn't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, just to face it, you know, that's another thing too, where people would hack it and they put like their their, you know, their handles and everything on there. So the FBI knows to hit, knows to target uh, Sabu, you know, or they know to target, uh, you know, uh, I can't, I don't know any handles off the top of my head, and I'm not about to drop any that I do know. So you know, they they start targeting specific handles. So let's just be careful. Just put your message on there, like "fuck fascism," blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. No shoutouts, you know, something like that. But a lot of people put shoutouts, and that's an issue. Because I thought I thought that that the reason why they wouldn't erase things would be because it was something of like of an injection of some sort where they couldn't actually access the root. And that, they... that too, a lot of times, uh, if they can't if if they can't gain root access to certain things and they can totally deface just add a deface page and that's it and that's to me that's a that's that's still a win in my opinion but not to the extent that you could get if you can root the server Mm -hmm. you're congrats look what you've done you're amazing you know (laughs) uh but other than that it's you know it's whatever get access to the server you still win yeah it'd be like the difference of gluing a lock or breaking all the windows. I applaud either one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, precisely. Or, you know, I'm, I'm more for the have five people come in, break all the windows while you kick the door down and then bash every cabinet and everything open. Take <laughs> the TV maybe if you want. I don't know. That's pretty great. <laughs> all are fantastic. Yeah, you know what? Take the TV and then show them or their computers and say what well, the last thing that, they, that their browser history is open. That's what I would do. <laughs> So what's the best way for someone to protect their website from different sorts of attacks? We've been hacked multiple times, and every time it pisses me off, but... Who, who hacked you? I'm not sure. I think I think a lot of times it's just, you know, backdoor security flaws that are within CMS things. Hmm. And it's not That's necessarily mali- or malicious in just any like sense. Just like bots crawling looking for them? I think we do. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um... Let's see. I'm, I'm bringing oh. up your website. Oh, here. shit. Let's... Well, don't right now. It's, it's terrible. It's fucked up I'm right not, now. I'm not yeah. going to hack it. I'm not going <laughs> to discuss it on the podcast. <laughs> but if you're using something like WordPress, you got to make sure it's updated. Mm-hmm. you got to make sure that you're not using any shitty plugins uh, mm-hmm. that can have leaks. If you're using a plugin, it's third-party code. So, yep. all the, again, your chain. Your imagine security is a chain. Every plugin you add on there could be a weak link. So mm-hmm. you have to make sure it's a good plugin or else I can break your chain, you know. Um, so a lot of these bots use something called Google Dorks. And it's just basically a Google code like that you can search. And it'll put, bring up every website that uses a certain plugin. And now I have a list of targets. And then I can just automate the attack. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. Just make sure everything's updated. Always, always update your software. So, you know, if you see the annoying Java update, which if you're using Java, remove it. For the love of God, <laughs> remove it. Um, if you're using Flash, for the love of God, remove it. But yeah. if you see these updates that annoy you, well, they're annoying you for a reason. Update the goddamn software, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Just make sure everything's okay. Don't do anything stupid. Don't download anything stupid. You know, mm-hmm. strong passwords. Use a password manager if you need to. And probably always back up. 
No, yeah, pro- always, always keep backups. backups. Remote backups too. Mm-hmm. Offline and remote backups. I keep a backup of your backup and a backup of that backup. I mean, there's <laughs> plenty of things that you can do. Look for solutions online, and you'll find tons. So, if this was a form of activism that somebody wanted to go down, what is the best place for them to start learning and e- exploring their options? Um. Well, are we saying from like a no knowledge standpoint? Um. I'd say both. Yeah. Okay. So if you're starting from level zero, um, learn programming first. You're not going to learn anything about hacking until you learn programming. Uh, Learn how to code in at least C and C++, maybe Python. Learn some assembly assembly languages uh, because those are really pretty key. Uh, Learn SQL. You know, learn your databases, learn your networking, uh, things like that. Um, that's for just for an entry-level person. Once you start doing that, then you'll kind of start understanding how uh, hacking works, and then you can start trying to do it. Um, but before you do that, learn about operational security. Learn security as much as you can. If you don't do that, you're going to go to prison. Uh, you know, things like that. Hang out with people who have the same mindset as you. A great group where I started with is 2600. They have a great IRC server. They have, with people who love to talk about this stuff, they have meetings every, I think it's first Friday of the month in in different cities. Don't talk about hacktivism there. Remember operational security. Don't talk about the things that you want to do or plan to do. Just talk about security with them and you'll learn a lot just by hanging out with them. Uh, Just go to... You know, conferences, I go to DEF CON, I go to HOPE, I go to B-Sides, I go to, you know, all these different security conferences. Go to those if you can, they're expensive, but, you know, they're worth it. Be careful who you talk to there. A friend of mine was actually forced to wear a wire uh, one once at DEF CON. That was this past one that I was at, it was really weird. A friend? Um, yeah! <laughs> Uh, I shouldn't go into too much detail, but yeah, there's a person who basically the FBI was like, either help us or get fucked. And I can't remember. I'm I'm not going to drop names. You can find the story yourself, but he was forced by the FBI to pretty much do it. And afterwards, he was really, he felt horrible about it and guilty and pretty much dropped out for a little while until, until we heard from him again. So they made him wear a wire and try to talk one of his friends into doing something illegal, you know, typical bullshit. Uh, but what, that's that's a whole other thing. So yeah, be careful when you go there. Remember, like I said before, operational security. Don't talk shop to these people. Talk security. That's it. Security is your is your uh, front page, and below that is everything else. So. Information security is the industry of keeping information secure. But a part of keeping that information secure is learning how to break into that. So, technically, you just say you're trying to keep your computer safe or learn how they work. And you want to learn more about programming. That's it. You know, shut the fuck up about hacking. Don't, don't talk about hacktivism there. <laughs> <laughs> so, general security yeah. culture. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, exactly. Shut the fuck up. That's what that's what everybody needs to know. <laughs> that's security culture in a nutshell. That really is, right? Like, <laughs> it, yeah. Seriously, stuff. It's it's one. Don't talk about it. Two. Don't fucking talk about it. I mean, yeah. yeah. yeah don't it's... talk about it. Don't ask about it. Stop people who are talking about it. You don't want to fucking know, anyways. Mm-hmm. And, and if somebody new shows up and they start asking questions, tell them to shut the fuck up. Mm-hmm. If they don't stop, if they don't shut the fuck up. Tell them to shut the fuck up again. If they continue to not shut the fuck up, tell them to be either shut the fuck up or nobody's going to talk to you anymore. That's the you got to get these people and like you'd be like, you're sounding really suspicious right now. Stop. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. if they're being suspicious, tell them they're suspicious. They might not know, but you know, it's yeah. They, shut the fuck up, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, thank you so much for, for uh, actually coming on and, and spending your time with us. Um, I, we would normally end by saying, how can people get in contact with you? But I'm pretty sure that's not what you want. So uh, would you? we end every episode saying, fuck shit damn. Would you mind saying it for us this week? Fuck shit damn? Yep. Yep. Fuck yeah. 
This week you heard Count Backwards to Black by Black Moth Super Rainbow. Right now you're listening to Harper Lewis by Russian Circles. iTunes. Hey, what is it going to take for you to just take a couple seconds out of your life? Rate and review us on iTunes. I mean, you don't even have to write a review. Honestly, I would much prefer a joke. Or you might even say, hey, you guys are a bunch of assholes. Let's just give us five stars. You can say whatever you want, honestly. But I, I would love to hear jokes. So go tell us a joke in the reviews. Whoever writes the best joke in the reviews, we'll uh, get a prize. You'll, like So it's like 100 vegan points, right? Yeah. You know, some, if you're not vegan, you can get... You can cash them in. You can cash them in still. You yeah. Brought, it's worth like a veggie patty or something. Is that what is it, uh, veggie patties are going for now? 100, 100 vegan 100 points? 100 vegan points, yeah. Okay. I mean, oh, I'll have to check my, my vegan account. Yeah, you can't you can't afford it. <laughs> if we're not yet friends, be our friend. Go on to the social medias and like us. Friend us, follow us. We talk about things on there every day that we don't talk about on the show. And we also post a lot of awesome stuff. At least I think it's pretty awesome. And, you know, if you want to be my friend, you should probably think everything that I think is awesome is awesome. So, and if you have something awesome you want him to post, just say, hey, post this. And he'll be like, mm, not not awesome enough. Or he'll be like, awesome enough. Yeah. But at least I will tell you it's not awesome. Because I respond to everything. Be our friend which side podcast.com click on the social tab that's all of our socials um security numbers we should really put them there that'd be funny <laughs> it's not funny at all <laughs> <laughs> dox ourselves <laughs> uh fuck shit damn man fuck shit banana Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>